We'll get started. Um, welcome everybody to the third uh, Golf Ireland Gender Equality webinar. So on the past two weeks, we have focused on the areas of leadership and governance and coaching and officiating. And this week we turn our, our attention to the question of visibility. So before we begin again, as always, everybody can submit questions throughout using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Um, and you will have your video and your audio turned off and the only people that you should be able to see are the panelists. Um, so campaigns such as the 20 by 20 campaign um, have highlighted the vast difference between men's and women's sport in terms of the coverage and visibility that, that we see. Um, the tagline can't see, can't be, is applicable to the content that you will hear from our speakers today. Um, and so to begin, I would just like to share some statistics. So if you bear me two seconds, I'll pop my screen up. So obviously these statistics are relatively negative. So they were um, commissioned by 20 by 20 uh, before the campaign started um, to sort of get a snapshot view of what coverage of women's sport, um, where it's at uh, at the point of before the campaign started. So hopefully when the campaign ends, um, the, the, the main aim obviously was to increase these figures by 20% by the end of 2020. Um, and hopefully we will be able to see a vast increase in some of these numbers by the time that those are published. So I'm excited actually to, to, to hear um, our first speaker, Deirdre Car Carberry, speak. Um, I have heard her speak before and she's spoken many of these forums um, before, so I, I hope you enjoy what she has to say. Um, Deirdre's background is in the military um, as an infantry commander um, and a gender advisor. Um, and she's going to speak to us about why she chose a, a male dominated career uh, despite the visibility and the expectation of what girls and women's women should do. Um, so Deirdre, like I said, has spoken on, on this topic in many cases before, um, and we're really grateful that she has been able to speak to us today. So thank you, Deirdre, and I look forward to hearing your story. Thanks, Carla, um, and thanks. I'm delighted to, to join today's discussion. And um, while my background and its relevance uh, to today mightn't be immediately evident, um, I hope, I'm hoping that Golf Ireland and our clubs and our volunteers uh, re represented on here today um, will ultimately see that you're not operating in a vacuum. Um, and the challenges that you may be experiencing in progressing equality or in progressing equitable participation, um, they're actually common across all industries, all sectors, and certainly cross cut, um, I'd say all aspects of Irish and global society as well. So you're not navigating this alone. Um, and I would say in this space, you are actually in fact, already way ahead um, of a number of organizations and already ahead of uh, a number of sectors as well. Um, so as, as Carla mentioned, um, I I'm currently a security strategist, but I did retire from the army after serving for 15 years with the Irish Defence Forces. Um, in the army, I was an infantry commander and um, I took command of my first platoon of soldiers at the age of 20, uh, way back in 2006. Um, but I was and I still am what we call it gender and a human security advisor. And all that means is that it's my job to know people and um, to understand social dynamics, uh, cultural dynamics, assess different um, security threats affecting men and women, girls and boys, um, to challenge assumptions, um, and to also assess how, how power is distributed within organizational structures. Um, I know that war, conflict, um, natural disasters, a pandemic, um, they don't discriminate, but people and social structures do discriminate. And we know that gender, as opposed to sex, gender is someone's perceived value in a given context, as opposed to the biological sex someone is. And we know that gender is a key issue that cross cuts every facet of, of what we do, uh, how we interact, uh, the opportunities we're given, uh, how we're treated and the expectations placed on us, both um, on, on men and women. So we're all products of, of our communities, we're all products of our societies um, that we're born into, and we're definitely shaped um, by it. So when I reflect back on my first 15 years of my professional career, and to draw some parallels between golf and my own experiences, I definitely chose a sector where women were in the minority, and they are definitely still significantly underrepresented. And I did choose a life that was probably atypical to the life society is telling girls that we should, that we should be aspiring to. 
But I have to ask myself now, um, and now that the, I've been out kind of for, for almost a year now, what was so unusual about my career choice? And where are all the women? Um, and where were all the women when I, I joined initially back in 2004? Well, I chose a male dominated career despite the lack of visibility and despite the expectations society places on what girls and women should do and how we should act. And these are very much contrary to the associations that we probably all have with, with military life. Um, I didn't have career counselors or teachers in school advocating for a career in the military. I didn't see women depicted in mainstream media or film. I didn't read any books about any great um, women uh, military commanders. And I do think um, that my uh, external environment was actually messaging um, to me that, um, that women don't really belong. Um, and that probably war is men's business. And I know, um, I, and I, I do think probably the low numbers are in choosing a career in the military are testament to this as well. Um, but now I know uh, that war conflict is, is everyone's business and that mixed teams and as much as diversity as we can possibly get into those mixed teams uh, is the only hope our security forces and our international organizations um, have at being operationally effective and have um, at having a chance at kind of long term peace and uh, sustainable peace. Um, for me, simply, I wanted to join the Defence Forces because I wanted to be a soldier. I wanted to serve my country. Um, but given the lack of visibility, what was it that drove me into it? And what was it that placed the military within kind of my, my orbit? Um, well, I, I now look back and look at how I was brought up and how I was socialized by my, my family and by my immediate family. And I now see that I was actually incredibly lucky. I had parents who encouraged me to partake competitively in sports and to be loud and aggressive even when I needed to be. Um, interestingly, I had a dad who taught me how to read a map by giving me a map, dropping me in the middle of the Wicklow Mountain National Park up near Trooperstown, um, giving me a pickup point and telling me to be back at his car uh, before dark. Um, and I think also as well, I had a kind of a very strong work ethic instilled in me at a very early age. And my brothers and I, even though we didn't realize it, we were never put under any pressure to conform to gendered roles. Um, and we were definitely given equity of opportunity to reach our own um, our own potential as individuals, really. And I don't think this was a con uh, I don't think this was a kind of a conscious decision or a choice by by my parents. Um, but it is interesting that one of my brothers followed my mom into primary school teaching, and I followed my dad into a career in the military. Um, I never saw a woman in uniform growing up. I only saw my dad. And it was really he that provided that visibility into a career that would never have been presented to me as, as viable or suitable or something that I should aspire to. And I do think now um, how different my life would have been if I hadn't been inspired to join, um, to kind of take the leap into this world that was presented by many um, as a men's only domain. Um, but what can we do, I guess, to, to change these narratives out there um, that aren't only confined, obviously, to the military. Uh, we also see it across sports um, and, and definitely, certainly with golf. Um, and what would I have done if I didn't have a family who encouraged me uh, to take up kind of these non-traditional roles as well? I have, for the majority of my career, worked in an all-male work environment, um, tradi traditionally rooted in physicality. And this is where I draw a lot of parallels uh, with sport. And um, I think it was when I was serving, it was about 6.3% women were, were serving, constituted the overall Irish Defence Forces. So I was always in the minority. Very often I was the uh, only woman in my unit. Um, and I actually had zero issue with that. I was brought up to be an individual. I never thought about a person's sex as having any effect on how they interact with others, uh, their value, uh, how they worked or how they're perceived. Um, but as I kind of progressed through my career and journalists really played a, a quite a key role in this as well. Um, journalists played a key role in reinforcing in me that my career choice was unusual. And in many interviews, I felt I was forced to justify my existence and certainly external to the defense forces. Um, as a woman, um, the narrative was that I was meant to be inherently more peaceful, nurturing, 
um, caring uh, than my male counterparts. And by virtue of my reproductive organs, I was told many times that I was a life giver and could never be a life taker and therefore unsuitable uh, to serve in the military. Um, but for me, this assignment of exclusive traits and behaviors are very simplistic generalizations. And they are incredibly damaging on all of us, both women and men. I, I think it kind of pits us, um, each sex against each other and puts a, us at opposite ends of a spectrum. But I never doubted my own ability um, to be an effective military commander. I never felt, and, and still don't feel that there's anything that I can't do, but I was always acutely aware of, of people actively seeking to validate um, stereotypical assumptions or people who saw women in uniform as this kind of single homogenous group and as kind of one group um, we're very aware that individual women were under this additional pressure of representing all women as we tended to be labeled as one as well but through my work um, my deployments overseas and kind of based on the experiences that shaped me I see that biases societal expectations traditional stereotypes, the assumptions we make, uh, the images that are very much pushed out there, the constraints that these place on women and men um, and how they limit us. This is something that I saw really clearly in a military and conflict setting. And if I could give an example, I mean, to be not too, to not go into it in too much detail, but I saw men who were victims of sexual violence and conflict but they were unable to access any, any treatment or support, men who were cast out by their families and their communities because they were no longer seen as a, a real man, uh, feminized in the eyes of their peers or and, and therefore kind of devalued. I met and, and saw women terrorists and rebel leaders who weren't perceived to be as dangerous as their male counterparts. And in a security setting, which I'd be kind of, you know, familiar with at this stage, it for me, it exposed some really critical vulnerabilities and gaps in how we as a society perceive men and women. And I found it really interesting, this kind of lack of understanding or these preconceived notions regarding the roles that women and men play. And I saw how severely it hampered the ability, um, in my case, of our security forces and international organizations to protect people. So a lot of the work I'm now involved in is around challenging um, these traditional gender norms and people's unconscious and conscious biases, um, looking at how organizations can break down these barriers and ultimately not only become more operationally effective, but become organizations that really are inclusive and are, are opening themselves up to um, attracting the widest talent pool that they can possibly get, inspiring the widest possible set of future leaders, future sports people. Um, but we always do need to be cognizant that we, we all have our own biases and they are shaping um, how we think, how we act and what we expect. Um, I think the key issue um, really is the challenges that we all face, um, regardless of where we are in the world or what organization we're in, what industry we're in. Um, the challenges we face are rooted really in the value that we, and I do mean the collective we, that this, this rests on all of our shoulders, women and men, uh, society, um, governments, the media, we as consumers of the media, um, the value we place on women, on women's bodies, on women's expertise, uh, women's work, um, and on feminine traits or what we perceive to be, you know, feminine traits and behaviors. And also, likewise, um, outdated ideas around masculinities and what makes a real man has really serious and potentially damaging impacts on, on men and boys. And I kind of ask, are we making it okay? Are we seeing images of, of men being vulnerable, uh, of caring, of taking a lead caring role in, in our homes and our communities? I still see men in the media being ridiculed for showing emotion. And in a country where men account for eight and 10 suicides, we have to ask ourselves as a society, are we still putting unfair and unreasonable expectations on them? And are we conditioning boys from a very young age not to express emotions or talk about their feelings because this is seen as something that's you know for the girls and therefore feminine and weak? Um, I think when we took look at some kind of barriers to equitable participation and how we can create this level playing field and increase visibility, um, where all those who want to participate or compete um, can do so. Uh, with the military and with golf, are we passing off low numbers of women 
low numbers of minority groups, et cetera, to maybe a lack of interest. And this is something I was told fairly regularly by so many people um, that women just simply weren't interested in a career in the military and that any recruitment efforts or promotion of women was futile. It was tokenism. It was equality gone mad. But I used to be part of the recruitment team going out to schools across the country. And what I found was that particularly teenage girls were many were never presented uh, the defense forces as an option. Um, many didn't know that women served. Um, and certainly many, uh, even fewer, were probably aware of the opportunities um, that were open to them. Um, so increased visibility is, is key to this. Um, for me, joining the military was definitely the best thing I've ever done. And yes, it was tough, uh, but serving in like the Lebanon or the Democratic Republic of Congo opened me up to all these unique experiences. and. For me, I got to experience some of the very best and some of the very worst in humanity. And also these experiences also forced me to examine my own biases. And for years, I probably downplayed my own femininity in many ways. Um, I, 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 I would have been quite, I think, a, a girly girl in when it came to kind of clothes or my appearance. But I did subscribe to the idea that kind of overt feminine traits and behaviors were somehow bad. I'd never wanted to be seen as weak or vulnerable. Um, so I, I kind of looked at, you know, not been wanting to be seen as maybe too soft or didn't want to kind of display emotion. But all this was turned on its head for me, particularly when I was serving overseas. And I did see that empathy, the ability to listen, um, communicate, show care, were far from the weaknesses or vulnerabilities that I'd nearly been programmed to think of them as, but rather were of really critical importance in, in my ability to communicate, break down barriers. Um, and I saw how valuable diverse teams were, particularly in conflict settings, um, a mix of different sexes, culture, ages, sexual orientations, backgrounds, skills, and personalities. I saw that these mixed teams increased our effectivity overseas and how we bridged each other's weaknesses and how kind of limited and constrained single sex teams were where everyone had similar backgrounds and experiences. Um, I used to feel a little bit kind of sorry for all male teams who were meant to go out and gather information on the population because they weren't able to engage um, in many cultural settings with 50% of the population who were women. Um, so for me, diversity um, and mixed teams proved an enormous strength. Um, and I had the opportunity as well to, on very many occasions, use my perceived femininity as an asset and not as a vulnerability and use the gender bias present in a lot of the local communities and the local perception of the role of women uh, to the advantage of our security forces as well. Um, so I guess just by way of conclusion and kind of reflecting back on, on those points, I think um, for me, what I've learned is that um, we're, we're all in this together. This is about collective action, men and women working together um, and progressing this. And for all of us to critically examine why we think some sports are more gender appropriate um, or why we hold such strong um, ideas around the roles of men and women. We do need to be really aware of our historical origins. They run deep in all our organizations. And to reimagine and to action progress is to challenge a status quo that's existed sometimes for centuries um, and is, is definitely, de uh, definitely rooted in these deep historical origins. Um, Gulf Ireland has, has definitely taken um, huge actions and steps forward, but we also have to be patient as well and be really measured in our approach because culture does take time to change. Um, and I, I used to very take a huge amount of time, particularly with um, countries and soldiers um, that, that didn't allow women into their forces, for example, or to serve in, in appointments that I was serving in. I used to take a lot of time uh, with those countries and with those soldiers um, to highlight um, and demonstrate uh, the reality on the ground and ultimately the benefits and positive sides of you know how this was the, to the benefit of us all but cultural shift does take time um, it's not a quick fix and it does require sustained commitment and um, by all levels as well um, I should also say that we're communal creatures and we're very much influenced by what we see so imagery storytelling are two very powerful tools and they permeate through every aspect of our lives. Images and the media are really what do shape our perceptions, shape the way we see the world and can serve as really powerful tools of propaganda as well, embedded in our psyche from the earliest of ages. Um, I have to admit myself in the past when I thought of golf, I definitely viewed it as a male sport. 
Um, I would have pictured, you know, male players. Um, I would have considered it as something that was not only for, for men, but men of a certain maybe age group, a, an older man. And I have to then apply my critical thinking to this and ask myself what has shaped my perception of the sport. Um, and as someone who enjoys all sports, why did I never consider it? Um, and I think it comes down to that visibility matters, accurate, non-biased, non-stereotypical portrayal matters, and one that isn't centered on the looks of the athlete or the individual playing or the participant or someone that's just going out to, to enjoy a round of golf, or definitely shouldn't be centered on, on motherhood and more, again, um, traditional gendered norms. Um, so we do need to tap into all these potential members who've never considered, I think, um, golf as their sport of choice. So thank you. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Um, I, yes, yeah, sorry, I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, there's a few points that I've taken from that and that are very applicable to, to what some of the people on the call, um, I suppose, like the point about some of our perceptions being ingrained in history is, is really interesting in golf, golf in Ireland under two separate governing bodies. We're hundred, close to 130 years old um, and like us being progressive, but patient, I think is going to be a key as we, as we transition into golf Ireland and, um, I suppose the volunteers that are at the minute are, are, are starting to work as part of mixed teams and, and work in, in the first ever kind of joint uh, regional executives and stuff like that. So I, I think there's a lot to be taken from that. And I think we do have a, a converted golfer um, in you and we're, so. we're going to try and find a, a get into golf program for Deirdre to, to join shortly. <laughs> um, <laughs> perfect. What I'm going to do is uh, move on to Tina and we pull it all back together then for a couple of questions at the end. Um, so next up, we will hear from Kleena Foley. Um, so Kleena started her career as a PE and English teacher um, before completing a postgrad in journalism um, at DCU. Um, so she has been a sports journalist for 31 years, I think it is, Kleena, um, and uh, has worked for independent media um, and then up, uh, from since 2015 has been a freelance journalist um, has covered multiple Olympic Games, Paralympic Games, Summer and Winter Olympic Games, um, and it was the founder of the first sports women's podcast Off the Bench in 2015, which is uh, now partnered with Off the Ball um, Media Group. So she's going to speak to us today about why unequal media coverage is sort of a larger scale issue, not just uh, applicable to any one sport um, and what we could potentially do to, to combat it. So thank you for Tina for speaking with us today and I'll let you take it from there. Thanks, Carla, and thanks so much to Golf Ireland for having me and to Deirdre for that, because she echoes so much of, of what we talk about and, and so much of what she's talking about there. One of the key things she spoke about was culture takes change, takes time to change. And um, I, I believe in that, but I also believe that the coverage of women's sport and the, uh, the visibility of female athletes in the last few years has changed considerably because people have actually decided that they're going to change that culture. And um, I suppose uh, I will briefly explain how I decided I was going to do that, how I think we can all do that in our own way and what, what the future is really. So just give me a second here. Uh, Carla will know I'm used to technology. So we're going to have to, we're going to see, can we get a few things working here now? And um, I'm just going to go through uh, a little bit with you on uh, PowerPoint. So, um, I'm still in that, uh, I need to go into the bigger one, that's it, just give me two minutes, that's it. So, um, and we're going to race through this stuff, and if there are any questions, obviously, um, put them to Carla, but basically, um, when we talk about, I suppose, the sports media, the complaint always is, we don't see enough women, why don't we see more women? And my point is, even with women's golf, it affects all minority sports. And that, that's what I mean by a minority sport is we, we don't see enough of any other sports that aren't the big five. And the big five are um, the big team sports, rugby, Gaelic, um, uh, soccer, horse racing, and men's golf, which is really interesting. And that's what a debate for another day, but largely men's golf. Um, the media industry is suffering badly um, because of the proliferation of mobile phones, um, new forms of media, traditional media has shrunk badly, advertising is down, everything is down. So when I started the Independent 30 years ago, 
oh, you know, you always had a staff person covering athletics, boxing and golf. That is no longer the case. Uh, a lot of this work now is outsourced to freelancers, which is interesting because it shows that the professional sports have taken over and the professionalization of rugby in particular is one that's a, that's been hugely taken up huge amount of space that other sports used to get before in the media. And I think if you look at media, you see that. And more and more than ever, this bottom line down here, media covers what sells and sponsors and TV coverage are linked to that as well. And the only people who actually will cover something because they think that it's worth covering are people who have a public service remit. So for you as volunteers or professionals, in RT RTE have a public service remit, your local radio and your local newspapers may have a public service remit, but everybody else is in there to make money. That's the reality. It's a very crowded market. Everybody's in there to make money. So the question is, how can we make women's sport, and in this case, female golfers, um, more visible in that, and golf in general more, more visible? It's really interesting to me that if, if men's golf is among the big five that gets a lot of coverage, why does women's golf get so little coverage? And this would be the sort of argument you would get from uh, editors or people running media, which is that, you know, small percentage of women uh, are golfers. So therefore, uh, there's not many people asking or looking for golf coverage, is there? Um, when we put it in, we don't get much reaction to it. I, I tell the story in 30 years, in what, 25 years in the independent and I left in 2015 because I could see the changes that were happening in media and I thought, oh, there's something I could do differently here. Um, I can count on my hands the amount of times I picked up a phone and somebody complained about the coverage of women's sport. Only four times I took a personal phone call, somebody complaining. And I was the only female journalist in the sports department in the independent. And you would think people would ring me to complain, but actually, personally, I only had five direct complaints. And that interests me because I think that people who are involved in, my, in my, what we call a minority sport or less known sports don't complain enough. And women don't complain enough as well, I think, generally. Also, the big thing is most, most sports writers and sports editors are male. There's one, one there, Daily Mail in Ireland now has a, a, a new female sports editor, but up until then there was none. It, it, broadcast is very different, but writing is, is very uh, male dominated. And I'm, my point is, if, if you're trying to persuade an editor to cover something that you know, you know doesn't generally sell or isn't you know, a big thing, well, if, if, uh, if, most, if it's mostly men, then they won't think about minorities if they're not interested in them themselves. And so we see that repeatedly, really. It's a, it's a vicious circle. So I'm quoting this line, well-behaved women seldom make history. I think it was, it, it, it's attributed to a lot of people, including Melanie Rosliff, but I think uh, there was a, an American historian, actually, Ulrich, who was the one who did it. I think women don't complain enough, and I'm always making this point when I left the independent I was at yet another you know conference on women in sport and the very end of the day yet again ended up with everyone arguing giving out about the media and saying it's all the media's fault and I felt at that point actually it's not all the media's fault it is there is a considerable amount of it the media's fault but I felt we're not taking ownership of it ourselves as women or people who are involved in women in sport irrespective of our gender so I thought what can I do to change things and so in a moment of madness, I decided I was going to start a podcast. I had no experience in podcasting. I know, still know nothing about radio production. Um, but I went to Off the Ball, who were a growing brand at that stage, and asked them, could I do a podcast? Um, would they let me go in and record a podcast about women's sport? And I started in 2015, December 2015. Since then, and this is what, you know, this is about culture change. Since then, if you look on the right here, we've interviewed we interviewed loads of we've interviewed loads of female athletes and, and got them sometimes before they hit big news. So that's the women's hockey team. And I had them in two months before they even went to the World Cup. And we had an amazing podcast with them. And they've been back to us several times since. On the left here, um, if anybody knows that January the 6th is called Nolik Naman or Women's Christmas, off the ball for the last two years have given us the entire live show on a Sunday, six hours solid to cover women's sport about women for women produced by women um so that's something that we've managed to do and you know i would have said a couple of years ago absolutely um you know nobody would nobody would uh, foresee that that could happen and it did 
Um, we have, uh, they do off the ball, do live road shows. Last year they did a women's one. This is it. It was absolutely packed. They held it in Dublin. Um, they literally had to push people home at half 10 at night. It was one of the biggest attended they've ever had. And we had, they had incredible, incredible female superstars on stage. But again, it proved to them that there's a huge audience for women's sport out there if you promote it and sell it and, um, and attract people and, and bring it to the right listener uh, audience. So, on top of that, while I was doing that, the Irish Times, I don't know if you know this, um, since 2015, the editor of the Irish Times, Malachi Logan, decided, the sports editor decided he was going to give a page every week to women's sport exclusively. And that still exists. It's in the Irish Times every Thursday. And that was a story that I wrote about Hazel Cavanagh when she won um, an L. Uh, 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 a PGA event here. Um, so they they have a space, they've put aside a space for women's sports. That was the first, and that still exists. Um, we know about the 20 by 20 movement. I think the fact that I, you, I don't have to introduce this to you, but the interesting thing about the 20 by 20 movement is that it was started, it was the brainchild of two women who run an advertising agency who would tell you themselves they're not sporty, but had small sons and daughters and decided, what can I do to help make my daughter get involved in sport and find something that she loves in sport? It wasn't a sporting organization at all. They brought it to the Federation of Irish Sport and they ran with it. Uh, the Telegraph in England last year decided they were going to be, again, proactive about women's sport. They appointed a fee, uh, an editor for women's sport exclusively, Anna Kessel. They also appointed two other journalists who work exclusively about women's sport. And a year later, they won multiple awards in the English press um, and uh, media coverage. And just out of interest to show you, so women's the Women's Soccer uh, Super League in uh, England started recently and they produced an eight page pullout. And if you look uh, up here, that's uh, Katie McCabe, the Irish international captain, who is interested that they've lifted her out to, to uh, underline Arsenal. So that's the sort of thing that is happening and it's started happening across the world. It's happening in America. It's happening in Australia. Um, it is happening elsewhere. It's happening across Europe as well. People are coming to realise that women's sport deserves coverage and they're finding new ways to do it. So to me, culture has changed. You know, culture about women in sport. We are beginning to appreciate women athletes more than we ever did before. We're not judging them against anybody else. We're just we're seeing them for what they are and their own brilliance. Uh, sports culture has changed. So look at that. You know, Katie Taylor, a boxer, female boxing judge. This is a female referee at a major international European men's soccer match. This is happening again. When when did we think these things would ha would happen in our lifetime? Advertising has changed hugely, you know, and I think particularly if you look at this one here, you know, um, which is for a female uh, a, a period product, but look, they're all images of, of girls and women in sport. So advertisers have now realized that they have, uh, that, that, that this is an area of interest, also that they have some responsibility, if you like, and also because they're linking the fact that we have female products and we should be targeting to what women are interested in. And now they understand that women are interested in sport. Um, and I think this is so well illustrated by the next two uh, images. If anybody's my age, you will remember that this was the image we used to see selling um, a particular uh, product. So it was all about how the woman looked um, and, uh, you know, this idealized figure of a woman. So this now, uh, if we can get it working, Carla, uh, is now the same company's advertising. I'm the one that can write my story. So that is, you know, a sea change in how people um, see women and how advertisement, uh, how advertisers now see women. 
uh, it's just an absolute shift in perception and um, percept perception of their of how they look what they're interested in you know their lifestyles everything else and golf is something that feeds into this so much as well all sports do so if if uh, if if advertising has changed what else has changed? And for me, the big thing, and one of the reasons why I went freelance when I did was because I think media has changed. So the traditional media always was print, newspapers, national, regional, and magazines, and broadcast, TV and radio, national and regional. And because they were only so few formats, and so few of those, there was very limited space. And there still exists very limited space on TV, we know, but that's changing. And because of that, their argument always is, we'll cover what, what gains most interest and what sells most. That's how we work. You know, we're, we're profit organizations, that's what we do. And as I said, RTE and some local uh, media will be different. They will feel they'll have a public service remit and a remit to their, to their local people. But otherwise, no, everything was what sells big. But then things changed. So first of all, websites came on and print now have their own websites. And the great thing about websites is there's unlimited space on websites. And I think that very often in sporting organizations, even in your club level, you don't, you don't think about the website and say, well, why not put something on the website? If you haven't got room for it in your actual product, in the hand, you know, physical product, could we get something onto a website? Um, and that's something that you can ask about. They still need to get in hits. They need to get people to be looking at it to encourage them to say, oh, we got a lot of traction for that piece that we did last week on the golf. We'll put in more on the website this week. But but websites exist now separate. They're separate from them, even though they might be under the same name. So you'd see different stuff on the Irish Times or the, or the RTE website that you actually wouldn't see on it. So look at that. Broadcasting has turned multi-platform, different formats, specialist contact. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but even something like if you if you if you know what a player is so like rte has done women's sports programs that they've only shown on the player so they don't feel that there's room or an audience or maybe a particular type of age of an audience first on their general coverage but they've put it on their player to attract maybe a younger audience who looks at television very differently. And if they get traction there, then that encourages them to do more of it on their mainstream production. So that's a really interesting thing to, to think about. Websites now, all websites, and that's even regard, I regard your own club website or your own you know, provincial website or whatever it is, you are now many media platforms. You can carry print audio video content all down to you know this lovely little thing called a mobile phone basically we're all carrying computers and recording devices around in our pockets now we can do a lot more with them the other thing that's developed in recent years is online news webs uh, news and sports websites so like the 42.a which is part of the journal or joe.a or h these are new subscriptions subscription services so it's basically like buying buying a paper or whatever but you have it online um and the athletic in america and now in england you know has literally in lit they came into England and literally took all the best uh, football sports writers and paid them and brought them all over onto the subscription site. So that's a growing area as well. Social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, these have all developed, right? So now with our phones, we can all become personalized media channels, if you like. That's how I, I regard myself now. And even if, even if I wasn't doing this professionally, and a lot of what I do, sometimes I don't get paid for it, I still think it's a great way to get visibility for female athletes and that's why we use it. Podcasts are another new version of people who don't know what they are. They're radio shows, basically you record them and they can be listened to wherever possible. When I started my podcast, it was radio only, but when Off the Ball saw what we were producing, they now put it out as well, except they're on furlough at the moment, but they put it out on their YouTube channel. So it's become almost like a little baby TV product as well. And that's what happens. And that's what new technology has allowed us to do. And the last thing I'm going to point out is cross-pollination. You may not know this, but old media, what we call the old traditional media, like the, you know, TV and, and journalism in its old form, if you like, it follows social media now to find stories. Before I used to have all the numbers of you know, players and things, that's changed now. I just go into social media, see what they're doing, and then I can find the stories about them because I actually can see what they're at, where they're going. I know where Leona Maguire is going next week. You know, I see what she's posting. So that's why there's a huge cross-pollination of, of media, which I think that sometimes people don't understand, even people who might be working in media services in their own um, national sporting bodies. It's a huge asset for you. So just to sum up, smartphones changed the world really and they created social media. This has given you the possibility to have increased visibility of athletes. 
largely online though. Um, but as I said, there's that cross pollination. If we spot it online, it'll come into the mainstream media, I guarantee you. The national governing bodies became more proactive and they do a lot of this stuff themselves. Carl is a classic example of somebody who does it very well. And sponsors have taken note of all of this. They're now uh, aware that, that their product can be seen in lots more places. So there's lots more reason for them to sponsor. Um, and, and there's two great examples of it here. So Lidl went in and sponsored uh, Ladies Gaelic Football. They put five million into the first three years of it. That's how much. Now, let's not be naive. They knew that Ladies Gaelic Football already had live TV. So they were buying a very valuable product there. But it has exploded to the point, as you see now, where they get 56, over 56,000 for the all to attend the All-Ireland Finals and, you know, millions to watch it. And similar there, Electric Ireland, big companies involving themselves in women's sport. So uh, culture has changed around sport. Media has changed. Have we changed? And that's the question I asked myself, had I changed? And that's where I suppose I wanted to look at how can I, how could we all harness and be better at making uh, female athletes or women's golfers in this case, uh, much more visible. So these are my tips. You build a relationship with some old and some new forms of media. And one of the things you've got to be is consistent. So journalists, if, if, if you say, I'm going to send you the results of that every Thursday at four o'clock because you've got a deadline at five o'clock, you know, you have to reproduce that every week. If you, if you let that slip at all, because they're so busy and there's so much going on in sport world now, they won't come back to you. They'll just say they're not dependable enough. Consistency is a huge thing. You give them stories, not facts. I think John is really going to talk about this greatly in his piece. But, you know, stories build audiences. You know, you, 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 the, the, the coverage and the analysis and the debate follows. You've got to grab people in with stories about your athletes. And that's really important. I think if you run a, a website, even as a volunteer, you should be doing the basic things that old media used to do. Fixtures results, get them right. But you've even more potential now to use that website with stories. And that's the same with your Facebook pages. Um, but again, I find Facebook pages are very, they're not kept up to date. And that, that's, that's something that I think we could all be better at. So you're using every tool at your disposal now, and that includes social media. But I have one warning to give on this. Don't use social media only. Because if you use social media only, you're in what they call an echo chamber. You're already talking, people who follow you on social media, they're already interested in golf and women's golf. How are you going to get new eyes to it? How are you going to attract other people? You have to interact with traditional media or bigger forms of media as well. Use your players. If you feel, don't feel confident enough with social media, absolutely use your players. Use all, and I don't mean your players, I don't mean the Leona Maguires and the Steph Meadows of the world, but like your juveniles, your, 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 uh, your junior players, they're, they would put all of us to shame on social media. You know, they're the ones who know how to use this stuff brilliantly and they'll do stuff for you that you that you can learn from. So, you know, the old thing, if you want to learn about technology, ask a four-year-old, um, use your players. They're the ones who really do this very well and teach you and soon you'll be rocking along with this. And then use your sponsors. And if you haven't got any, you use, you use new media to build that audience and to get sponsors. And that's something I feel really strongly about as well. Narrative matters. A good story, this is what I preach to my editors for years. A good story is a good story, irrespective of gender. This was the first refugee to win an Irish cross country uh, national championship. Brilliant story, feel good story. Papers love feel good stories. Often hear people say, oh, media only wants bad news stories. John will probably echo this as well. We love good news stories. They are the easiest things in the world to write and they get the best, you know, they get the best attention. So we love them. Um, Great pictures help. This is a Saba or a Thai restaurant and they sponsor the Irish women's hockey team. So, you know, creative pictures help. That's a really clever picture. It's very bad. That's a very bad reproduction of it, I should add. But uh, it's just a clever photo, right? But it doesn't have to be. Photos can be really powerful and they don't have to be by, be made by uh, very expensive, you know, um, corporations and places. For example, look at this one. 20 by 20 sent out a message and asked people, send us images to promote, do something proactive for it, send us an image. It was a call to arms, which worked very well in social media. And this was a school in County Clare did that. Didn't cost anything. I'd say somebody probably took it on an iPhone. Look how powerful that is. And that's my message always about pictures. Don't think, oh, oh, it's not been taken by a professional and we have to get a professional over here to do it. You know, pictures are powerful and they lead narratives. They lead questions as to, for people to say, oh, why did you do that? Who did that? Who's that? And so it leads to narrative. 
this is a particularly lovely one. I love this picture. Um, I think Carla, Carla put this one up um, and it was part of her work. Um, this is, a, uh, was it the Tara? I think it was a, uh, was a Tara Golf Club in Meath. They had no juveniles uh, four or five years ago. They won the inter-club juveniles. And this was a picture to demonstrate that with a lovely, beautiful story. But I mean, incredible success story. The narrative to, to match this was incredible. They had no girls in the in the thing. They dropped the prices, I think, for their juveniles to 50 euro to get more juvenile members. Um, they got something like, uh, I'm not sure, was it 64 girls joined when they started this? And four years later, they won the All-Ireland and they still had 41 of those girls still as club members. You know, and it is something that I think golf is really working hard at, at modernizing its image and getting young people to join golf clubs. This was an incredible story, but look at the photo. The photos, photo spells joy, and it's just a great example of a good photo, but it also had a brilliant narrative. And so if you can match those even better, but the photo sometimes will lead. Somebody will say, what's that photo about? And the local paper would say, what's that about? And suddenly you have great exposure. I love this picture. It's a really, really, really lovely one. Um, this was after the, I think, Gary's close. Annabelle Wilson won it. Um, an 18 year old won it after a playoff. You know, she's the, you know, one of the new bright new hopes of Irish golf. What I really loved about this photo, and I think Carla tweeted it and I retweeted it. And again, this is about how you interact with media. It, what I loved about it was it, the history. So she's looking at the history. She's an 18 year old that's just won it. But what I really love is look at the takeaway coffee, the phone and the charger. Like that spells youth, that spells this, how young this kid is. And it would prompt a journalist to ask her so many questions about her sport and why she got involved in her sport. So to me, that's a really smart, clever use of a photo. It doesn't have to be perfect. I have not reproduced it very well here. The original was much better, Carla. But um, it's it, my point about it is, look, keep your eye out for these look, these photos that will prompt interest. Um, look, we could talk forever about gender bias and sexism and stereotyping and Deirdre's, Deirdre's right uh, in accusing us in the media of it all the time. But I also think that that sometimes we can go overboard on uh, on the female athlete side of things. And because there was this trend for, you know, saying, oh, you wouldn't say a man was a, was a parent. You know, you wouldn't say, oh, father of four. You'd say mother of three. Well, yes, actually, you know, my point is nowadays, I will say mother of three because I think that is incredible. How does a woman come back in to the elite end of her sport having her whole body change in childbirth how you know how how does she manage for childcare? you know we know we know all of the imbalances that are there in relationships and families and, and child care and all of that you know how does she juggle sport with small children and this was a, a picture uh, this story got a lot of coverage because uh three mothers were on a team that had won um a provincial title so i don't think that's a sexist story i think that's a great story and this is my point you can present women as mothers in sport without it being sexist and we've had huge conversations about that and it's something we talk about on off the bench all the time you know because we heard about how women weren't being um supported by their sponsors in athletics and things in recent years it, it is these have become really interesting stories for women's sport so here are my kind of guiding principles which i hope will improve people uh, people's coverage including my own i i decided i was going to change that mindset of you should you should cover this you should cover this that's what i used to say to my editor you should cover this you should cover this uh, and he'd go well you know who's interested in what size of the crowds and you know how many people are involved and think we could cover this and how could we cover this? And I really feel strongly about feeling, finding a media ally for yourself and learning from them. And that's just at your local level, at your provincial level, get to know journalists or radio people or whoever it is that has access to places that make, can make things visible and get those allies and, and ask them what they want and learn from them and be consistent in your interactions with them. Sell them stories, not facts. So what I mean by that, and John is going to elaborate on this, is sell them people, sell them people, sell them rivalries, sell them history, sell them accomplishments. You know, I mean, that question there, Annabelle Wilson, you know, there's the narrative is she's an 18 year old, you know, not only was it a playoff, she's an 18 year old. Where is she going to go in the future? What does she want to do? Does she want to be, become a professional golfer? All of these things. So she sells, sells stories, not facts. And that really is the key to good journalism and good um, press relations always. 
improve what you're already doing and be consistent with it. If you have a website or Facebook, you know, I would urge you again to be up to date because I, as journalists, I go in to look up stuff on websites and Facebooks and I find the last post was two weeks ago. And to me, that's not good enough. You know, if you're serious about really, really serious about promoting your athletes, male, female, I don't care what sport, I don't care. Be consistent because that's the only way to fight in what is an incredibly crowded market. Um, use the social media, use the people who are good at social media if you're not. And honestly, you will be surprised what follows because, you know, um, I've had people come back to me and just and be amazed sometimes at where something I've tweeted or, or put up has gone and how it's influenced somebody. Um, and again, we, we're now at the situation where we have the technology. So use it to improve your own. You know, we can you could even do little podcasts yourselves using uh, at the moment we're furloughed uh, off the benches furloughed. There's no money for it. I, I'm doing it myself voluntary again. But because I'm juggling with a few other things, I, I don't do them often. But I literally just I'm using Zoom to make little podcasts and put them out. So, you know, it can be done. It's not impossible. And it's really interesting where it leads you. I feel really, really, really strong about allyship. And I really feel strongly, and I know I'm delighted to hear Carla was telling me that about 40% of today's audience, as has it been for the, for the previous webinars here, are male. I feel really strong about allyship. And I think you're at an incredibly brilliant place now in Gulf Ireland, where you're going to be one joint organization. So there is the power here for men to support women and women to support men. And I'm not sure whether you knew this or have heard of this, but like this summer when the European Women's Tour was cancelled, um, two, one of the players, Liz Young, and a, a guy she knew, this guy, Jason McNiven, they were trying to, they, they on, on, online, I noticed them, they were trying to see could they run their own events and Justin Rose came in and he gave them money and they actually ran a small series. Now you look at and go 35 grand, that's not much to Justin Rose, is it? My point is, it's a start. It's a start. They set up a little mini tournament. They ran it. And that was a male golfer supporting them because he has the money that they didn't have. This allyship thing, I think, is huge. And I think we should be seeing way more of it than we see. But I was delighted to see that this summer and equally delighted to see this. So you probably know Sky Sport had the coverage for the Women's British Open um, and BBC didn't. And BBC were showing the um, highlights at I think it was a quarter to 12 one night it started so Lee Westwood stepped in and had a go and then a few more male golfers stepped in and had a go and because they're powerful and because they get a lot of attention and because they know media people then this started to trend as a story and a lot of people started to complain and we go back to my old thing about why don't we complain more it's interesting isn't it that when the men complain about the women's coverage people listen more um, that's not that's not balanced, that's not equitable, but let's use it. Let's use that and let's let's use whatever we can. Um, and, and you'll know then that this happened this summer. So we know that that um, Shane wore the 20 by 20 logo. Um, to me, no big deal. I'd expect him to. That's how I view it now. I view that we should have this allyship, that, that, that our male counterparts in sport should be speaking up for our female counterparts in sport when we see that there are inequities there. But what I thought was really interesting about this was that for, for Shane Larry to wear that 20 by 20 logo and support the movement on his t-shirt that week, he had to get one of his sponsors to drop theirs. And there's where we're talking about allyship and power and how you use these things together. So that, you know, so that's really interesting. It wasn't just him deciding I'm going to wear this. It was one of his sponsors agreeing that this is something worthwhile to do on a social level, that we have a responsibility here to women to do something for them in sport as well. And I think that's really interesting. And it just shows where we've gone in that short space of time. So uh, finally, um, this is, I think, all of our challenges. Me as a journalist and everybody who's involved in sport is how do we create more visibility for women? How do we find the allies? Let's go out and find an ally somewhere, somehow find a new ally. Share my great, find the stories in your sport and share them with your ally. And this can be done at local level, at, at provincial level, at national level, and international level. And then it comes all the way back down into a circle because if you, if you find the ally and you find and share the stories with them, you will create that visibility. There's a word in Irish, uh, the word in Irish for women is mano. Um, and uh, I really feel that anybody who's doing anything for women's sport is awesome.
And I think the challenge for me on off the bench and for everybody else who's involved in it is to be even more Manasan. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Lena. It's it very interesting. And I find myself thinking back to the 2002 World Cup um, where I had Robbie Keane on my, the back of my jersey when I was seeing Katie McCabe on the, the Telegraph paper there that it was amazing that, that the girls that are that age now will have those people to look up to. Um, I'm going to move on to John just because we're running a little bit short for, for time, but that's perfect. Um, and we'll come back then if, if we have time at the end for a couple more questions. Um, so finally, we have John Short from uh, Irish Golfer magazine. So Irish Golfer are a, a media partner of the GUI, the ILGU um, and the PGA and uh, are committed to equally representing all aspects of our sport in, in Ireland um, and further afield. Um, so John has a background in golf club management in the hospitality industry um, and is the owner of Irish Golfer um, and is leading an Irish Golfer's commitment to the Women in Golf Charter. Um, um, so John, I'm going to let you take it away from here. I know we're going, we're close to three o'clock, but we'll just go a little bit over time and, and uh, we we look forward to hearing what you have to speak about. No problem at all. I'll just share a screen here with you now um, to, and kick it all off. Well, hopefully that's it. <laughs> Firstly, I just wanted to say thank you very much to, to Deirdre and Kleena. Um, they gave superb, superb talks there. There were some, some, wonderful, um, some wonderful points made. Um, particularly, just to highlight a couple of things that Kleena said before I get going on this, um, about selling stories. Um, that's, that's a huge thing. Um, trying to get people to, to sell stories and, and, and get people engaged with, with athletes and female athletes is, is a huge part of the whole thing. Uh, we try to focus on the positive stories. We stay away from all the negative news. There's enough of that on, on the 6-1 or wherever else you want to go to try to find it. Um, and she also mentioned something about a media ally. Um, look, if anyone's looking for a media ally, uh, get in touch with Carla and she'll give you my number. Uh, we're happy to take <laughs> and any, any other you know, golf allies uh, that we can. Uh, we're always looking for good news stories. We're always looking for interesting stories. Um, so, look, you know, take this as an invitation, whatever you need, send it through to me, look, we'll do whatever we can with it. So, so before I get started, it was just to, to highlight a couple of things there in relation to that. Um, so, so who are we, right? We're Irish Golfer Magazine and Irish Golfer.e. Um, the, the main company is called Match Play Media. Um, I own it, we're the largest golf media company in the country. Um, the Irish Golfer Magazine is the the biggest and most read golf magazine here in Ireland. And a number of years ago, we launched IrishGolfer.ie, which has grown over the years to be the number one golf news website here. Um, so overall, the company was formed six years ago. Um, part, of our, part of our reason for doing it was that, you know, I wanted, as a golfer, I wanted to find out more about amateur golfers. I wanted to find out about male amateur golfers, female amateur golfers, Irish PGA players, and quite honestly, back at the time when we launched this, there was nowhere you could go to get this information. It wasn't in the mainstream media. Um, and we thought, look, here's a great opportunity to do something that we are very passionate about, we're very, very, feel very strongly about. And we'll also be, you know, breaking new ground. And, it, you know, it was a legitimate business opportunity, you know, as we thought. And um, there was definitely like a focus on, on, on the amateur scene, male and female. Um, also a lack of focus on junior golf and, and, and other things like that. So, so we saw it as an opportunity to change it, um, to focus on the amateurs, to feature more women uh, predominantly, as you can see here, this was Leona Maguire uh, as an amateur golfer on the front cover of a national golf magazine. That was the first time that's ever happened in Ireland. <laughs> so like, we were delighted to be able to do that. Um, what we wanted to do was, to, you know, we felt that look, if you, if you want to make a change you have to affect the change. You can't just wait for someone else to do it. If you want it to happen, you go out and you make it happen. And that, that's what we wanted to do. So that's where we went. So how do we go and do that? Well, you know, so from the outset, we were very conscious. We wanted to feature more ladies. Uh, we took the decision to put, the, to put Leona on the cover, as you saw. Um, her amateur cover that was there was followed a number of years later by her first professional cover. Um, both the covers are side by side in the hall of her home. 
um, you know, it's it, it's quite a wonderful thing to be able to say, you know, that we did that. We also featured other professionals such as Stephanie Meadow here, um, and we featured amateurs as well, um, you know, Sarah Byrne, Olivia Mahaffey, and so on. I'm just highlighting the covers here because we don't have a whole lot of time, um, but we, we dedicated specific pages and we still dedicate specific pages and pages in the plural, like it's multiple, it's as many as we can do. We have a minimum delivery that we, we, we you know, that we try to, we try to do, but, you know, we give as much space as we can uh, to ladies golf in every single edition of the magazine across, <clears throat> pardon me, across the website, across all of our social platforms. We've also got a podcast where again, we feature the ladies wherever we can. Uh, we ran a, a, a professional and amateur golf tournament this year. Uh, we put a 10,000 euros up for grabs when there wasn't a lot of money to be had. We had, you know, Leona McGuire actually showed up to play. She was competing against a whole load of other, you know, male amateur golfers, oh, sorry, male golfers. Then there were amateur golfers like Olivia, Olivia Mahaffey, uh, Julian McCarthy, and so on. They all were in the field as well. It was, you know, it was something pretty groundbreaking to, to be done at the time. So, um, so we focused in on, so I'm focusing in on the front covers here, but we also did feature interviews. We try to connect the, the, the people with the audience. So, you know, in order to give a kind of a background to someone like Stephanie, you've got to give it a bit of time. You've got to help her to connect with, with the audience and give them a reason to, to follow her, um, you know, and be engaged in the article and so on. So, you know, it wasn't all our doing, obviously, um, you know, these girls are good. I mean, it's it, it's quite simple. Uh, I mean, look at that. What an iconic picture of, of Maria done there. I mean, it was, you know, things like the Solheim Cup that was on here. Uh, I mean, these girls really proved that they were stories on their own. You know, they didn't really need us to make up a story about them. They were delivering the goods on the golf course. You know, it, it, it was fantastic. They didn't, I won't say they made it easy. But, you know, they certainly helped us along the way <laughs> to, to, to doing the job that we, that we tried to do for them. So our focus is always to try to give equal billing. So there'll be no second billing. There's no, oh, well, we could always also do this. It was, no, no, let's, let's agree a plan at the beginning of the month. We're going to feature this, 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 that, that, that. And, and the ladies were always in the mix, you know, opportunities for whether it be covers or articles or features or podcasts or whatever we could do. Uh, wherever it was possible to do it. You know, it wasn't an afterthought. It was something that was part of the plan, part of the process all the way along. So you know, we're very proud to have been involved in, in this from, from the outset, um, you know, highlighting the players of tomorrow, people like Leona who've gone on and Stephanie who've gone on to do, do wonderful things uh, in the game. So, um, so, you know, why did we decide to do it? As I said, look, initially there was no mainstream media coverage really at all of the amateur game and particularly of, of the ladies game. I was a fan of, of golf, I was a fan of amateur golf, followed ladies golf. I wanted to know what was going on. All the people that I knew also wanted to know what was going on. There was nowhere to find it. So we thought, you know, we'll go ahead and do this. We saw it as a market opportunity. So um, even though there was a huge support for the game, you know, it didn't, re it didn't translate into the coverage and we, we thought there was an opportunity there to mix it in with things like the Irish PGA, things like, you know, Shane Lowry, Porter Carrington. It shouldn't be one gets more billing than the other. And that was a big part of what we wanted to try to do that, you know, it was, a, it was, a, the magazine is called Irish golfer. If you are an Irish golfer, you deserve to be in there, whatever the gender. So, um, again, as, as we all know, nothing worthwhile is ever achieved on your own. So, you know, where we've gotten to, we haven't gotten to by ourselves. It's through the support of, you know, these female golfers, but also through our partnerships with, with, with Carla at the LGU, the GUI, the RSPGA, the Challenge Tour, and so on. Um, you know, we were delighted to strike media partnerships here, um, and they all fitted very well with our, our mantra of supporting golf from the grassroots up. Um, you know, so it was all very... You know, very, very organized. Um, we also selected one player each year. And unfortunately we haven't had a lady fit into this category yet, but that's coming next year, I think. Um, one player each year where we support them with a special editorial um, and special support. So this year, actually that, that golfer, um, it's Brendan Lawler, who's the disability golfer. And we've helped him with special interviews in the magazine, special features, 
help him to get some sponsors and things like that. So, you know, hopefully we'll have a, a, a lady on the on the show for that one next year, Carla. So, um, so look, ultimately, as I said, this is a case study more so than than the other presenters that are here today. So, the real question is, did it work? You know, did all this focus we had on lady golfers, female golfers, amateur golfers, junior golfers, did it, is there a business in it? Um, six years on, the answer is yes, definitely. <laughs> um, the magazine is the number one in the golf market here. It's the only ABC audited golf magazine in our sport. It gets sent to every single golf club in the country. Uh, the website is the number one golf news website here. We're averaging over 60,000 unique users a month. And, you know, for anybody who's doubting it, uh, some of the biggest stories that we see uh, digitally and in print are the lady golf stories, the female golf and focus stories, whether it be you know, this is the cover that Leona had as a, as a professional golfer, that one sold off the shelves in the shops. It's the one we get the most demand for in terms of people asking for back copies and so on. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's, it's definitely a viable business. There's no, there's no question about it. So, um, so look, things have changed a lot since we started. Uh, things like 2020, uh, this level par program, the women in golf program, Carla mentioned earlier as well. Um, you know, we're proud to have been, I suppose, the, at the tip of the spear six years ago. There wasn't really any coverage. You know, we d we do as much as we can, but all these other uh, programs and initiatives that came in um, since then have have really pushed things on quite a lot. We're just a part of the solution. Uh, we're proud to be part of the solution, but we're only a part of the solution. Uh, more needs to be done, and certainly things like this, um, and, and, and fair play to, to Carla and everyone involved for organising it, uh, will help to push things on. Um, and then what's next for us? Um, look, as, as Carla said, look, we've signed up to the Women in Golf Charter. Um, we already do an awful lot, so like, you know, why would we do that? Well, I mean, we did it because although we feature female golfers as much as possible, we wanted to have diversity throughout the whole business, um, not just in terms of talking to, to the golfers. Um, we want to have the charter pushes us to develop opportunities for women in all, all, pardon me, all aspects of our business. So, from writing to working in the business to to being involved in in, in every level of everything that we do. Um, you know, we we will of course continue to promote the ladies game and 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 ladies golf, but. You know the charter pushes us to to take the next step and expand what we're doing as a media organization i mean we're just one media organization in the in the wider media organizations that feature golf um but you know i'd like to think that we're we're doing the best that we can to try to you know try to affect the change wherever wherever it's possible so say so short and sweet hopefully that was enough to to cover all the high points for you but i'm happy to take any questions Thank you, John. I'll just get you to unshare your screen. Perfect. Um, and I'm going to copy that to gallery view. Um, thank you very much. I Like I said, like John mentioned there, that was kind of a case study about how um, I suppose some of the, the theory or whatever works in, in practical terms, um, which which is great. Um, and I do wish uh, Irish Golfer and, and John the best with working towards the signing up to the charter because I know golf clubs and stuff around the country are considering signing up to the Women in Golf Charter and what sort of commitments that they might um, put in place. Um, I have got a little bit over time, over time even, uh, but that's that's no problem. We There's still a good few people tuning in, so that's good. Um, I, I had one question, I suppose, and it's sort of maybe a general question um, in that, I don't know who wants to jump in and answer it, but do we think that we will ever reach 50-50 equality um, in terms of media coverage or in the whole terms of, of women in sport? Um, I don't know if anybody wants to take that question or I know Kleena might have some sort of a, an, an idea for uh, in terms of the, the, the wider visibility of it, but will we ever reach, I suppose, complete equity in terms of visibility in sport? I'll just unmute you. I think you just need to unmute yourself there, Kleena. 
And even though the population is is split, in fact, I think where we fifty one percent women, um, the reality of life is that more men are interested in sport than women. You know, and and if you put a group of men and women into a room, the reality is that they're more likely to be talking about sport on the men's side than they are on the women. But that isn't the golden rule, but it is the general thing. And I actually don't think, I, I'm not sure that you will ever see equality in terms of the volume of coverage. What, what, I, what I think we desire is equality in terms of the respect that we give to athletes, um, the way that we cover their sport, you know, the language we use, it was really good on that subconscious bias, the language we use, how we value them, um, and also, I think women have to get better at telling their stories. Um, we know that women don't put, you know, all of the research tells us even when they're going for a job, they 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 think that they're inadequate, you know, and they don't if they don't have every single thing on the list. And um, my experience has been that, you know, women. I might go to a place and um, I'd say, you know, first question every journalist asks, what's the story, you know, and they'll start to tell me something. And a few days later, I discover that, you know, they're full forward you know, is had a baby four months ago and is playing in the final this weekend. And they didn't tell me that. And um, I find that more uh, with, with female athletes and female sports. And so I think we just need to have more confidence in ourselves and then also be more critical of the media. There's emails now. Why aren't people, if, you know, why do we see so little coverage of the US Women's Open, which was extraordinary, had an extraordinary finish. And the British Open, the woman who won the British Open, the German woman who had, who had Lyme disease, why didn't we see that all over our media? And if we if we think it should be there, we should be sending emails to media and saying, why didn't you cover that? I think that's what's going to increase it as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think we all have that. Um, I suppose we all have that responsibility. And like um, you said, it's it's not all the media's fault and we do all have that opportunity to step up and, and show or, or say what we think, I suppose. Um, uh, Deirdre, I, I, I've, I finally come to you. I think I, um, I touched on the fact that your perception of golf was that you know it's for that older generation so I suppose um, if you have any advice for us as to how we could maybe make golf a little bit more visible for for people like yourself no and you know what it definitely would have been a like an old perception um and that's definitely changed and I think that's testament to all the efforts um both from Golf Ireland but as as Kleena and and John actually had uh, demonstrated fantastically like how the media has changed as well um, I think has has all gone into shaping um, like I now follow um, say her.ie 2020 like Instagram Twitter um, and that's all been fantastic for me that um, again that you're kind of opening yourself out to this this kind of uh, kind of new world and like all these incredible role models as well that we probably don't see as much as we should see uh, in the mainstream media and um, so I definitely think it's something like I'm working with our National Veterans Association at the moment as well on uh, increasing our um, numbers of women uh, who are joining our, our Veterans Association that you know the numbers of women in the Defence Forces are, are low anyway but they're disproportionately low in our Veterans Association and a lot of what we're doing and actually I, I think I can I can actually look at, at some of the actions you've already taken um, as an organization um, and bring those back and say, look, there, there are certain things and steps that we can be taking. Um, and it does um, require kind of concerted efforts. It does require leadership. It does require people um, uh, driving actions and also holding people accountable for inaction um, or taking actions that aren't you know, promoting uh, equitable principles. Um, and I, I do think, I actually do think that that you're doing incredibly well. You've definitely, um, for me, uh, opened up kind of another sport that I definitely now will consider um, and will definitely join um, a local club. Um, but just on your last question as well, in relation to 50-50, I think for me, gender equality or equality is not a numbers game. Um, you know, and I do think it is really, for me, it's always about providing equity of opportunity, giving, providing that level playing field because we're, people don't start on a level playing field. So what can we do as an organization and a society to level that playing field and, and inspire people to join, um, accommodate them, facilitate them, support them in joining if they want to. Um, you know, as, as Kleena said, you know, we mightn't, we mightn't ever get there to 50-50, but as long as everyone feels that, you know, there's a place for them there if they want to step forward into it, um, I think that's the key as well. Um, equity of opportunity is really kind of always my, my goal. Yeah, I think that's the perfect way to, to wrap up today's um, session. I really appreciate it, guys, you, you, you helping us out and, and coming to speak with us. Um, I hope 
there's a few questions or comments coming in there that there there's a lot of positivity and stuff in the the virtual room today so um thank you again very much and um, i for next week's seminar we is our last uh, webinar on this um in this series and we are going to focus on participation and um, so as always i'll be circling the link to that uh, in the coming days and you will be able to view this um recording afterwards and um, so thank you very much again guys and um we will let everybody go so thank you thanks carla our pleasure